Welcome to the National Science and Technology Medals Foundation's virtual series, where we're meeting the top minds in STEM to learn more about their paths to success. I'm Sarah Williams, a science journalist. Chatting with me today is biomedical scientist Natoki Ford. Dr. Ford was a senior policy advisor in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy during President Obama's tenure, and she continues to be an outspoken advocate for promoting social change in STEM. She is the founder and CEO of FlySci Enterprise, a consulting company focused on accurately portraying women scientists and scientists of color in entertainment, as well as addressing disparities in STEM education. Thanks so much for agreeing to chat with me today, Dr. Ford. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Is there a particular message you're really trying to convey to your audience? So I consider myself somewhat of a poster child for imposter syndrome. For those who may be unfamiliar with what imposter syndrome is, it's essentially the inability to internalize accomplishments or achievements and people often feel like a fraud. Largely, I'm just sharing my story and my journey as a woman, as a black woman in STEM. And I talk about my experiences with imposter syndrome from when I began graduate school. So I transitioned from historically black university in the South Clark Atlanta University to a PhD program at Harvard. And this was really challenging for me. And this was really where imposter syndrome first struck. So a lot of what I'm doing is really being transparent about my challenges and my struggles in hopes of empowering others to know that they may be experiencing something very similar to what I went through, but it's important to know that they're not alone and that they can get through this and just really empl employ different tactics consistently over time to get it under control. And so I talk about my own experience in, in dealing with imposter syndrome, but also I'm talking a lot about the importance of promoting greater diversity in the STEM workforce and why it's really imperative for us to draw from the diverse pool that we have because our future is, is really critically depending on it. I think it's fair to say you don't have a typical job that people think of when they think of what a STEM PhD does. I've always followed my heart. If ever there was an interest that I had or if ever I was in a space where I felt like I needed to take a step back, I did what I had to do to um, do what I felt was best for me as a, as a complete and a whole human being. So my journey in STEM, I, I'm somewhat of a person that reinvents myself every few years. And I will say what has led me to where I am. I certainly, if you had told me a decade ago that I would be doing what I'm doing now in terms of being a social entrepreneur, speaker, um, consultant, et cetera, I wouldn't have believed you. Um, maybe I wouldn't have, it's not that I wouldn't have believed you, but I would, I would probably be very surprised. Um, when I first arrived at Harvard, I ended up taking a leave of absence after just one semester. Again, I was really struggling with the imposter syndrome and I didn't know if a PhD was really for me. I didn't know if I was cut out to uh, survive the rigors of a PhD program. And so the due to the fact that I was struggling academically, with struggling emotionally, it was in my better interest to take that time away from school. So I took a leave of absence, I moved to LA, uh, and I decided if I'm gonna take a break from science, I wanna go as far away as I can possibly get. And I wound up um, pursuing a career in acting, uh, <laughs> like wait for it, acting. Um, but uh, of course I quickly discovered that I was not willing, willing to starve to become an actress. This is obviously a hard career to get into as well. And uh, I ended up taking a position as a teacher, a substitute teacher in the Los Angeles Unified School District. And this is how I really discovered my passion for motivating and inspiring kids. This is really what prompted me to go back to Harvard to finish because I had a driving force that was helping me to see myself just beyond what the accomplishment of attaining a PhD in STEM could mean for just me. With all that being said, I've, how, I let, how I've arrived where I am today has just been a culmination of, at different intervals, if I had an inclination or something that was pushing me to, to either take a step away or to go and do something different, I, I listen. And so I feel like there's never really been a failure, but rather each of these life experiences has, has given me new information that I've been able to use to uh, propel me forward. So then after finishing uh, my PhD program, I did a short postdoctoral fellowship, and then I wound up going into science policy as a AAAS science and technology policy fellow. And so 
landed in the Obama White House in 2012, which was an incredible time to be coming to DC to work in science policy. And then uh, after the fellowship ended, I had a, a bit of a break. So I ended up taking about a little under a year and really thinking, how do I bring all of these pieces together. Essentially, the work that I'm doing now is a culmination of everything that I've done previously, as I said, from being a teacher to being a once upon a time aspiring actress to an, a, a research researcher in a lab and even a person in the policy space. Um, what helped you to you know, be okay with just following your path? And where do you think students can turn if they feel like they're overwhelmed or don't fit in? Or what, what words of advice can you offer them? Far too often the expectation, especially when you're pursuing a career or degree in what is considered a very rigorous and a demanding field, the expectation is that you're supposed to be overworked and you're supposed to be burned out because that's the culture that we've created. And frankly, I think that's a real tragedy because in reality, we should be judging ourselves based on our productivity and the progress that we're making, the actual products we're producing, and not just by this sheer uh, thought that we have to just constantly work 16, tw you know, 18 hours a day and burn ourselves out just because that's what's expected in, in terms of the culture. Now, there are times where you do have to burn the midnight oil and um, really work extra hard to get certain things done. But I don't think it's it's wise and sustainable for that matter to expect people to do that constantly day on day in and day out year after year because you do I think compromise the quality of what you're able to produce and as someone who has even very recently experienced burnout um, I didn't even I didn't recognize what it was because again I had been so used to just working myself so hard going so fast and then I got to a point where I was just exhausted all the time not only was i exhausted but i just i didn't have any sense of excitement for anything that i was doing and in theory and this was just two years ago this wasn't that long ago i would say a piece of advice for students that might be feeling overwhelmed is that's your body telling you that you need to take a break and i will always encourage and implore people to be kind to yourself listen to your body's um be judge, judge yourself based on the quality of your work, the products you're producing, and not just this idea that, oh, I have to work 18 hours a day or I'm not being effective because in reality, it's not about the time, but it's about what you're producing. Most fields of STEM are still plagued by inequalities. There are racial and gender biases in hiring for jobs, whether grant proposals are funded, who talks at conferences, whose papers are published, and even how much money both research faculty and clinicians make. What has to happen to change this? Are there easy first steps that people who work in STEM fields should be doing to help? You know, can an individual affect change in this arena? Oh, absolutely. I You don't have to be a person in a, a traditional sort of leadership role. Uh, to, to be a person that can have an impact in this space. One, I think everyone should see themselves as allies when it comes to being advocates for the importance of diversity in STEM. So it shouldn't always fall on the shoulders of the underrepresented groups. And so what does that look like? If you're invited to speak on a panel and you notice that you are on a panel and it's only white men or white people, then someone should be able to speak up and say, I think we need to have better representation on this panel. This is not reflective of the world and we have to do better. In your workspaces, I think we have to um, really do more to un better understand the things that are effective in helping people become aware of implicit bias and how it impacts work culture. The culture aspect is so critical because again, it's not just about attracting People, you have to re retain the diverse workforce. And th this great um, analogy I've often heard is diversity is being invited to uh, the party and inclusion is being asked to dance. I think so many times people show up in spaces and feel like they have to change different parts of who they are to make other people feel comfortable. And frankly, I think it's just a tragedy and it's, and it's a real unfortunate circumstance that has to be addressed. And one of the things that I've done 
even if it may seem minor, but you would be so surprised, is in my physical appearance, how I present myself as a woman, as a woman of color. All that being said, I think what can more people do is number one, show up as your truest self, bring your whole self wherever you go, because you never know how that can inspire someone else. And even with my, going back to my appearance, my hair, being a black woman with natural hair and showing up and wearing my hair in its natural form, unapologetically. I, I used to wear this really cool uh, Janelle Monet inspired pompadour. And I had a, I did a video uh, when I was still in the White House. And there was a friend of mine who told me she showed that video to her daughter. And the little girl said, wow, she's, she works in the White House and she has hair like mine. So it's these things that may seem minor, but they have such a big potential for impact. So again, what can everyday people do is number one, show up as your truest self, bring your entire self to whatever situation you find yourself in. Uh, number two, be an ally, no matter who you are, to speak out on when you see an underrepresentation to address it. And I think the absolute last thing I'll say on this topic is if you are a person that finds yourself in a space where you are among the few or the only person that looks like you, just recognize that it means that it's that much more important for you to be there. And so never feel like you don't have the right to share your perspective or that you don't, that you shouldn't share your voice. Our last question we're asking everyone in this series, what are you reading, watching, or listening to right now, STEM related or not? I have been on a bit of an, I've been into audiobooks a lot lately, especially as I've been trying to go on walks to keep my sanity as we are in the midst of um, COVID-19. Uh, but I will also say, certainly with the recent events around what happened with George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, um, I have my heart has been really heavy and I've been really thinking a lot about how do we really leverage all of the work that's already happened, I know, to address not only police brutality, but also just this systemic uh, racism and institutional racism that exist. And so with that being said, uh, one of the books I'm, I just started, uh, so I can't tell you a lot about it just yet, but I just started uh, White Fragility by uh, Robin D'Angelo. Uh, before that, I was on a, a bit of a kind of a memoir kick. I finally got around to becoming by Michelle Obama. I'm a little embarrassed to say I just now got around to listening to that. But I've also been in a bit of a sort of a mindfulness uh, book um, streak. I don't know what I want to call it, but, but I've I've recently gotten into books like The Power of Now um, by Eckhart Tolle. Tolle? Tolle? How do you say his name? Sorry, I mispronounced his name, but The Power of Now. Um, Deepak Chopra. I've, I've also gotten to some of his books, The Happiness, The Ultimate Happiness Prescription. My readings of late have been all over the place in terms of topic. And ironically, I'm not reading any books on that are STEM related. But yes, a lot of what I'm reading now is um, from memoirs to uh, understanding uh, racial biases and just how we can do better to have difficult conversations about race, because I do think that's important. The only way that we're going to be able to truly heal and move forward is just by being direct and, and having these uncomfortable and difficult conversations but then also i'm focusing on mindfulness and wellness and being fully present and just finding joy in life and letting that compel me and propel me to keep going through the difficulties well thank you so much for joining me today i'm really excited to hear what you do in the future this is the National Science and Technology Medals Foundation's virtual series, and I am Sarah Williams. 